What's happening, everybody? This is Ryan here for the Scale Up Show. I have an awesome guest, a co-founder named Cliff Simon, on, who is also a CRO. And we get into RevOps. We get deep into RevOps, which is one of the most underutilized, under-discussed areas. I think that can be the biggest needle mover for a business. On top of it, too, we look at, and this is applicable for whether you're in sales, whether you're a sales leader or a founder, essentially ecosystem-led growth. And we go deep on that, get hyper tactical. So look forward to having you in here on the episode. How do you grow like a VC-backed company without taking on investors? Do you want to create a lifestyle business, a performance business, or an empire? How do you scale to an exit without losing your freedom? Those are the questions, and this show is the answer. Welcome, everybody, to The Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Cliff Simon. Cliff is the co-founder and CRO at Carabiner Group. Uh, Cliff is a personal friend of mine. I've met him through multiple communities that we're involved with. And one of the things we're going to talk about today that I think Cliff is absolutely amazing at is RevOps. And we're going to talk about the concept of RevOps as a service. Cliff, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate you being me. Being here with me. <laughs> being me. You're like me when I do my first intro and I kind of shit the bed. Uh, but anyways, we, Cliff and I were riffing and we were talking at a lunch one time when he was in Chicago. And I was like, this is so good. Like, I got to have Cliff on as a guest because like just he was dropping fire. And so I wanted to share him with you so you can understand some of the things that he's doing and some of the knowledge inside that big old brain of his. So Cliff, why don't you give everyone a background just on like who you are and kind of how you got to that point and like some of the things you're involved with just so everyone has some context. Yeah. Hey, um, I am the CRO, like you said, at Carabiner. Uh, my background is about two decades now of mid-market enterprise selling. Um, this is my third time now doing a zero to 10. I've done a zero to 10 and a zero to 15, um, both as an IC and as a like manager director level. Uh, but my first time getting to be in the C-suite, which is fun. Um, I oversee everything go to market at Carabiner. Uh, also have had the pleasure and privilege to be an advisor to some startups. Um, so I really enjoy that, getting to see different go-to-market processes, help folks figure out problems. And I think that's sort of what ja- jazzes me up and gets me going is taking a look at a problem set and trying to figure out the best solution to drive that forward and to get to a desired outcome. Yeah. And like, he, he's kind of understanding what he's doing. Like Cliff's got, Cliff's got the pulse on a lot of different things in the industry right now. Everything tech, everything AI, uh, RevOps as well, which is an area that I think is highly misunderstood and probably half the folks that are listening right now don't actually have, have it, aren't familiar with RevOps and, and haven't implemented it in their business. So can you give just a real quick snapshot of just like kind of how, did, how would you define RevOps and then RevOps as a service as well? Yeah, I think, yeah, to your point, right? RevOps is this thing like, uh, my, like we were talking about before, my LinkedIn post today was about what is RevOps? You know, you, you can ask five people and get 10 different answers. and that's really frustrating, I think, for a lot of people. Right? In the SaaS community, we start all coalescing around this concept of sales ops, marketing ops, CS ops all being brought together. I would say the definition is even broader than that. And it's really like, what happens when you put money into a machine or into a factory and all of the conversion rates and all the data points along the way to the end result, right? And then how do you use those data points to to pull the different growth and uh and adjustment levers within your business to make sure that you're doing the right things at the right time for the right reasons. <laughs> now, if you're not in SaaS, most people think about this kind of stuff as digital transformation. How do I take an antiquated process and make it better? Right? And we just happen to call it RevOps within our uh, specific ecosystem. And to your point, it's grown tremendously. If you looked at LinkedIn, God, this time two years ago, there were 5,000 people globally that had a RevOps title on LinkedIn. That number is now 180,000 in two years. Wow. It's crazy. And granted, a lot of those folks were doing that type of work already with some type of sales ops or marketing ops title, but it's, it's exploded. So it's, it's been fun to see. Well, okay. So I think that's a great description of it. Like, what would you say are like the top three outcomes that RevOps provides then for an organization? And then like, when's the best time to implement it? Uh, like strategically is what I would say versus reactively. 
strategically as early as possible. Uh, I think that if you have the ability, and it doesn't have to be a full blown piece, I think sort of where RevOps as a service comes in, um, not to like push our own stuff, but there is this need from the very beginnings of a company to understand your customer journey, even if it's a hypothesis, because RevOps is science, right? You are constantly putting together a hypothesis, you're testing it, and then you're looking at the empirical data thereafter to say, all right, what do we have to adjust, right? Just like you would an experiment. And the earlier you can do that, the better, because the more data you have. Um, a lot mm-hmm. of times what's happened is you know, sales ops, and in, especially in startup world, right? You get a VP pushed on you. You've got this guy that's got the Rolodex. He's coming in. You get a bunch of customers. You think you've got product market fit because you hit two, three, four, five million in ARR. But that didn't actually happen that person just had really good relationships and you never captured any process around what that customer journey looks like. And now you've hired the second VP and you're trying to figure it all out the second time around, except now you've taken money and now you have goals that you have to hit. Um, so the earlier, the better. Um, what are the big things that RevOps helps with? Data governance, understanding what, what the customer journey looks like, understanding what customers to go after, understanding how to keep them happy and keep them in the door. Uh, I think RevOps touches all of that. Yeah, I, it's so funny because, like, as you were talking, it reminded me. I was literally just interviewing a, an RVP yesterday, which would be a great person to introduce to you, is David Farrell, and he works at I think they're three hundred million dollar company, and he was identifying like a specific situation where he was the revenue leader at a company or no, a rep. This is him as a rep, right? And he's revenue leader now, but he's just basically like, one of the things is the CFO called me in his office and I was like, whatever, 10, number 10 performing rep out of like 300. And he's like, you know, you're not closing your, your leads. We're, we're taking these away from you. We're giving them to someone else. And um, he, (laughs) the funny thing was, he's like, yeah, he's like, you've only, have one in process out of 30. Well, because David knew his information and was able to really demonstrate it. He's like, listen, 28 out of those 30 like leads or appointments canceled before I even got a chance to meet them. So, so my close rate's actually at 50% because I'm one out of two, right? <laughs> so, so like, I know that's like a super, I don't know, kind of ridiculous or extreme example, but like, I can see what you're saying, man. Like, if you don't have your pulse on the data, like super tight, you could just make really bad decisions. And would you say that's one of the biggest mistakes that you see companies make all the time? Yeah, and I think the biggest one tends to be in marketing uh, early on, right? Because people just pump money into Google ad spend or they're pumping it into uh, LinkedIn targeted ads and they're going after a very finite ICP. So the diminishing returns on that spend hits pretty quickly. Like You're not going to get an exponential growth curve there. Um, And being able to be humble enough and honest enough to realize when those things are happening and to pivot away from the things that aren't working, I think it's far more important than understanding the things that are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could see that. Like, so like moving on from that or, or kind of progressing a little bit, I think we got the data side, we got the customer journey, like at what, and I know you said as early as possible, but typically when do companies start taking this series at what revenue range? Like, when is this something that, you know, it's not, it's like, it's like table stakes, right? Like where you got to have it really nailed. Is there a certain revenue range you're seeing where companies are really, really focusing on it? I think the the table stakes comes in probably right as you're grabbing your A. Again, you don't, At that point, you probably don't typically need a full-time person, but you will pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, The thing I see the most at B and C is that RevOps folks are so overwhelmed with all the things that they have to touch and the level of expertise that they have to have in order to be successful that they're putting in 110, 120% of effort breaking themselves down and wearing out and they're never getting to the strategic pieces. They're, they're just so stuck in the tactical day to day that they haven't taken the time to really pull back and help the company get to where it needs to get to. So th- the company's always at a deficit from an operational perspective. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
the, the place I think that it becomes the, the right move is to say, I'm a RevOps professional. I'm very capable. I, I have all this knowledge, but I'm actually going to only give you 70% of my capability. We're going to touch that 70%. These are the pieces that must fall by the wayside because we have to do that strategic piece. We have to keep the business mm-hmm. moving forward. If we don't do that, we're never going to be ready for that next fundraise or that strategic M&A or Lord willing an IPO someday. And these are the additional resources that this will require if you want to get all of this done and treat it like you would a product, right? If this is the thing that's going to unlock your business, why wouldn't you invest there? It's not a cost center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's going to get exasperated with all the tools that have been released. Like literally we were talking about this before, right? We've had like, I think it was like, probably 15,000 new SaaS companies effectively created with all the new tools this year alone. Yeah, there's supposed to be another Something like 30, 30 40,000 SaaS companies this year. Yeah. And so, like, I don't know, man. I think it's, it's going to get weird. And then you have agents that are going to get brought in the mix, right? Like AI agents that are going to complicate things. But, like, how do you, how do you imp- see something like that impacting RevOps where – basically AIs stringing together the different tech tools and, and basically enabling that process, making it simpler. Do you see that as um, something that's going to happen sooner or later? Because I, I think open AI has got a pretty big plan for that um, in the short term. So I'm just curious on your thoughts. I think there's a path forward in the next three to five years and maybe sooner. And we're really bad at telling how fast technology is going to advance, right? Um, where all of these things become stitched together you know, through technology uh, in a way that doesn't require a massive amount of human intervention, whether that's AI or AI assist, I'm not sure. Um, We're already starting to see glimpses of that with call recording technology, that information being fed through some type of API into a tool like GPT, like a, like an uh, Anthropic, and then making its way into the CRM. Um, that I think it has a much more realistic way of uh, showing up and helping drive the data governance piece. On the other side, you've got the data now. You still need somebody who understands what those data marks mean to then interpret it and then make business decisions based off of it. And I think that's where we get the, the, the human-machine divide. Um, so I'm curious to see when that occurs. Um, I still think that's like pretty far uh, across the chasm for a lot of folks. But it's coming, and it's coming faster than I think any of us anticipated it coming. Hello, this is Ryan here. Real quick, if you are enjoying this episode, please hit the subscribe button and leave a comment or review. If you want more help or just want to learn more about what the top SaaS CEOs and founders are doing, check out my website at www.ryanstaley.io. Join my newsletter, check out other free content resources I have there, and let me know if you want to scale your business. Now back to the episode. All right, Cliff. So one of the things that I was thinking about, because I ran into you conceivably more at events than I have any other single person in the world. And so, and these are unplanned, right? We haven't scheduled. Sometimes we have, right? We, we've found time to connect. Lunches don't count. Yeah. But like Slack, like you do a really great job in Slack communities and in other areas. And I know you have a ninja skill within there and you've talked about it as ecosystem led growth. So like, how would you describe that and how do you deploy that kind of like in your go-to-market and, and revenue growth strategies? It's a couple different things, right? You and I have talked about this a bit. It's um, <clears throat> treating the B2B experience similar to the way we would treat a B2C experience. How do, you, how do you do that from a go-to-market perspective? And so many companies in the B2C space drive revenue through word of mouth and referral. Well, how do you do that? You have to stay top of mind. And that's where marketing plays a huge role. But you don't have to necessarily spend the way that people traditionally have in order to have a similar level of effect, right? As executives, we are stewards of capital, both financial and human, and there's only so much that you can do. So why do it the same way everybody else is doing it 
if there is a more effective way for where you are as a company and for your level of spend. So that was sort of like the thesis behind how we started. <clears throat> um, and then driving that through to your point, being constantly seen, whether that was in the digital space or in person, you know, um, I think I've mentioned this to you before, Seamus and I have probably done something in the neighborhood of like a hundred and I don't know, 30, 140, um, executive dinners in the last like two years or something. Um, it's a ridiculous amount. Um, but being in person and being able to add value to people without expecting anything in return, we know that it's going to lead to something down the road, whether it's a referral to a friend of theirs or um, the VC or PE asks for help, whatever it might be. Uh, as long as you're top of mind and you are the thing that you're buyers or your your buyer's sphere of influence is thinking about in that moment of a decision um, when they're actually actively buying that's the important piece yeah yeah i you do do a really good job of dinners and communities so like how do you approach the community aspect because i think that's one of the areas that a lot of people suck at right and like it's as when, when I've heard you talk about it, I'm like, yeah, that's really obvious, but a lot of people aren't doing it. You know what I mean? Which, which are the most powerful strategies. So like, how do you kind of approach it from a community perspective, systematically and strategically, and just like kind of break down a framework. So uh, you'd listen has some takeaways. Yeah. Well, first off, when you're in a community, your role is to be a good steward and a good member, a good citizen of the community. Mm -hmm. right? You shouldn't be selling in a community. You should be adding value to other community members. And in return, you should be trying to gain value, not necessarily from a financial perspective, but from a knowledge perspective. Um, I think of when I joined Pavilion, right? This is my first role in owning marketing. I didn't feel like I knew much about it. So I probably spent one to two hours a week networking with someone in marketing at the VP or, or C-suite level to understand what made them successful. What were the plays that they were running? How could I then uh, take that and morph it and make it work for us in the way that we designed our go-to-market? Um, and you do that for a year and you learn a lot. It's like getting a crash course MBA without having to pay for it. Um, Cause you get to learn from everyone's shared experience, which is incredibly powerful. And then by having all those conversations and learning from others and giving value to others, all of a sudden, one, you've learned way more than you ever thought you were going to. And two, you've created a whole bunch of guerrilla marketing for your brand because now people know who you are and what the brand that exists. And um, it has a powerful knock-on effect, right? Because originally, it was just people within Pavilion. And then within RevOps Co-op and all these other communities that we're a part of, uh, got the sales assembly hat back here too. Um, but then that, that sort of has the concentric circles of, uh, of influence, right? And, and that's where it's really taken off. So you did... And it's a long play. It which is interesting because like, I don't think we've talked about this. So you did, you, did you purposely meet with one, one person a week or two people a week? Or what did you do? You said over a course of a year. I didn't know you did this. So this is cool. <laughs> um, on the marketing side, yeah, I did uh, one to two a week for a year, call it 14 months. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, so that's how you did it. And it's, I mean, that was just to learn marketing, right? But like the whole ELG, like community led growth piece um, in 2021, it's probably like on average 83 meetings a month um, that I was booking and meeting and talking to folks. Um, as I built out a team, that number dropped off for me personally last year down, I think, to 55. Um, but still, a good amount of meetings that I was booking on a monthly basis in order to continue building up the company and the brand while having a team that I was managing and, you know, the other responsibilities of running a business. So wait, 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 wait. We'll play that back. You kind of skimmed over that. So you were doing 83 meetings a month by yourself. I was booking 83 meetings a month. Booking. Yeah. Okay. And that was all through the community. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how did you do all that? All through com various, various communities. Yeah. Okay. And how did you walk us through that? Cause that's, that's like insane. A well, first of all, props to you for actually putting the hard work booking those, right? And then I know that there's not just a magical cliff fairy that comes along and attends all those. So then you had to attend those as well. And and now you know you got a team. It's probably slowed down, right? You don't have to do as many, but like, um, what's your system for doing that? Like, how do you? Because I've seen other people talk about it, right? I know we've spoken about it. And if you're open to sharing, we'd love to hear. Yeah. It. 
um, and, and share yeah, so it's, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? It's na- there's native functionality inside of Slack that allows you to source for and get notifications for specific keywords. If there was keywords that touch the things that we cared about from a carabiner perspective, I included it there as well as stuff that I knew about. Um, you know, almost two decades now of go-to-market experience across a really wide variety of industries, I've seen a lot of different stuff. I've worked for Fortune 20 companies. I've worked for large multinational um, customs companies like so- and then software companies. So like just a lot of different things I've had the chance to see and touch. Um, so because of that, a lot of different places that I can add value and have good conversations. And that will inevitably lead to something else, right? Whether it's now or, or later, right? We, we signed a customer in October from a dinner we held in March in Denver, um, out of the blue, right? But remembered us in that time of need. Um, On the other hand, just being really active in community, I can think back to one specific call when we were doing a CRO school. Um, It was the medic run. And I'm like, I'm never gonna use medic. My sales process is too short. It would add friction to the buying process. I'm not gonna do that. And then uh, I remember Shane Oren uh, called that out in the middle of the big group where they're like, hey, would anyone hear anything interesting? And it's like, yeah, Cliff should say say what he said to us. And I was like, yeah, I've got a six-figure sale that happened sub-30 days. Um, it, Medic would slow that down. And I just remember the chat going off like, what do you do? Do you sell drugs? Um, <laughs> but that one conversation led to five customers because people hit, up, hit me up after the fact. So that led to five new customers and at least two hires that we made. Um, in the, you know, that knock on effect was maybe call it, you know, five new customers over the next two, two, three months because of that one comment and being an active member in a community. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Uh, And I mean, a awesome result, right. To get six figure in 30 days, 60 days is amazing. Right. So props there. Uh, and then, yeah, it's funny because I've seen that happen too with stuff. You just make like a comment and you're not trying to sell. You're just being present, yeah. right? And sharing something. And, and then, yeah, like crazy opportunities happen as a result of that, right? So it's, uh, that's totally cool. Half and the battle I, is showing up. Well, too, and you do a good job of that virtually. I think the keyword strategy you leverage in Slack is huge. But like, I remember like, before I really got a chance to know you, one of the things I was like, dude, this Cliff guy's everywhere. Like he's always answering questions and stuff. I'm like, what's what's going on with him, right? Like, does he does he sleep? What, what what's going on? You know, so not too much. But that's that everywhere effect. And I think like, I mean, like, let's just take LinkedIn, for example, and the algorithm shift they had <laughs> three months ago or two and a half months ago, where effectively they they chopped down like the level of reach post and organic content would have by like 70%. Or eighty percent. Um, here's the thing: like, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but like, it's not going to get any more. Like, it's it's going to keep going down because there's going to be a flood of all this AI generated content. So, what you're doing mm-hmm. in communities is, I think, going to be magnified even more uh, going forward. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? I think uh, to quote like Will Allred, right? We all have this like mental uh, spam filter. Um, I think as we're all scrolling on LinkedIn, we're starting to have a re... And even this happens in Slack communities too. Like people will post answers that are clearly written by GPT or some type of AI. Mm-hmm. We're all sort of just filtering those out and maybe it gets the view, but it's not getting engagement, yeah. right? Um, and Lord willing, like that stuff all sort of falls away. Um, and I- I'm sure there's going to be an increase for a time, but we all as human beings crave authentic interpersonal relationships and you can't you can't get that from an ai Mm -hmm. yeah especially in person do you think there's going to be a big like wave or movement in 24 to more in-person meetings or not in-person meeting in-person meetups shall we say i think in person is back in a huge huge way uh the number one way that in the in the doldrums of 2023 that I heard from all of my CRO friends that was working for them was in person word of mouth, right? That's the only thing that was consistently driving top of uh, funnel when everything else was drying up. Uh, 
So I think we're going to continue seeing that everyone's doubling down on the thing that they know is working. It's building relationships with other people, getting them together and adding value to them. Yeah. So true, man. I think that's sage advice. Okay, cool. Well, we're almost up on time. So one other question I had for you, and, and that's the change about you know how we've kind of gone from grow at all costs to now it's like profitability at all costs. Like, where do you see that heading in, in 24, the rest of 24, 25 and beyond like with that? Because there's some massive changes with that just psychologically yeah. and culturally. So I think it goes back to the ecosystem with growth piece, right? Um, we all have to understand that it's not about doing more with less. It's about doing less really well, right? Like it's got to be all of the appropriate pieces coming together whether that's the right pieces of technology, the right service providers, the right talent inside of an organization, the right investors who aren't going to just cram something down your throat because they still expect the level of returns that they saw over the last 10 years. Um, there's there's got to be this mental reset across everyone, right? It is now sexy to run a business that is profitable that's only doing $5 million because you're never going to run out of money and you can take the time to figure out the appropriate product market fit and you can take the time to actually um, service your customers in a way that benefits them and doesn't just benefit your organization because you have X amount of top line revenue or you triple, triple, double, double, right? Um, I, I think those days are over. And I, I mean, with just with the, the advent of AI and um, the amount of folks that are hitting the field this year, we're supposed to say like what, like 30, 40,000 SaaS companies. I think a lot of them are just going to be very, very good point solutions that address a narrow ICP and they yank in half a million, two million, three million a year. And you go and build like six of them, seven of them with a team of four people, AI assisted. And now you're living a really cozy life. And if one of those ICPs falls off, you just build another one. Like, I don't know. It, and it makes a lot of sense. Man. I mean, like in, in the, I think, I don't want to say the unicorn because they're, I don't know, they probably are a unicorn now, but like a great example of that is mid journey, right? Like there were, I think 20 people they have and they're a hundred million dollar company, right? Like it's just wild. And I, they might even be 10 people. I don't know. Maybe they grew to 20, but like there's examples like that where you're going to see superhuman level of, of just outcomes because like software creations got democratized, right? Like it's it's getting cheaper and cheaper, which has never happened before, right? Um, white collar. You don't work. even need to learn no code to write stuff anymore. Like, I know it's it's crazy, man. So, um, yeah. So we, we got an interesting time ahead of us, but I, I think that's spot on. So, um, unfortunately, though we're up, up on time. Where can people find you? Where can they find out more about? Carabiner, not Carabiner, Carabiner group, <laughs> right? With what you're doing with RevOps as a service, because uh, let them know, man. Yeah. That's pretty easy. Uh, carabinergroup.com. If you guys want to check out the website and if you want to connect with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the Cliff Simon with the little white cloud in front of his name. Um, <laughs> that way I know the spam filter, right? Um, it, it's great for that. But yeah, feel free to connect with me. Happy to have a conversation. Awesome, man. Well, Cliff, it was awesome having you on the show. It was great to reconnect with you again. So thanks for being on, man. Awesome. Appreciate you, bud. All right. Appreciate you as well. And we will see you on the next episode. And I appreciate you too for listening. Thank you for checking out the Scale Up Show. My mission in life is to help founders and revenue leaders avoid all the pain and suffering in revenue growth so they can flip it and create a life of their own design. So if you enjoyed this show, please like, review, share it on social, and more importantly, just share it with a friend. Share it with someone that you think could learn and benefit from what you heard on today. But the more we get the message out, the more people we could help, the bigger the impact we make, and the bigger the community gets, which helps everybody. So once again, thank you for being a loyal listener. I appreciate you and look forward to seeing you on the next episode.